Okay, welcome back. We are here with CryoCell this morning. And I think I misspoke before. We have got a break right after Marion presents. And so everyone will have an opportunity to go warm up their coffee, get some tea, all the things. So welcome, Marion. Thank you so much for joining us today. Hopefully we don't have any technical difficulties, but so far we've got an amazing bunch that has been really, really uh, responsive and understanding. So with that being said, I'm going to pass the baton over to you. Thank you so much. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining me. I've been a cord blood educator for over 20 years. I've helped thousands of families. And I have to tell you, I truly believe this is one of the most important decisions you are going to make before you have your baby. Uh, you cannot go back and get stem cells once the baby is delivered. So you really need to be informed, have, be educated, be prepared with a collection kit. And um, I'm here to help you every step of the way. Uh, I am in Austin now and been, um, you know, as I said, working with all of the hospitals and OBs in the area. So please call upon me after the seminar if you have any additional questions and even would like to pursue uh, receiving a kit. Uh, so today I'm going to give a little bit of an overview of what, why these cord blood stem cells are so important, what you need to know, how to be prepared to collect. Please feel free to ask questions and I will follow up with anybody um, after the seminar. My email uh, is being typed in right now, and uh, we uh, can exchange information. So uh, the first thing I want to say is I, I am uh, a core blood edu educator for over 20 years, and I've worked with all types of families, uh, LGBT, um, you know, families for adoption, families um, with tissue donation. Uh, everybody can bank cord blood stem cells. Uh, this is an option that's available to everyone. And I am truly an advocate. I've seen this field uh, advance. When I started over 20 years ago, there were 20 standard indications for cord blood banking. It's up to 80 now, 80 approved indications, and it will continue to advance, especially now at a faster pace because of COVID. And COVID is really dry driving a lot of medical innovation now, especially using cellular therapy, um, using your own cells to heal damaged tissue. Uh, actually, the core tissue was just approved for lung inflammation due to COVID, uh, which is extremely exciting. So what makes these stem cells so special? Uh, they are very naive. They're very young, very healthy. They can create new cells in the body. They can differentiate into other cells besides what they have been identified as. Uh, in the cord blood is the blood master stem cell that differentiates into red cells, white cells, T cells. And in the cord, cord tissue, uh, within the Wharton's jelly that protects the vein and artery are these beautiful young master structural cells called mesenchymal. And they will give rise as a stem cell to any structural cell in your body, um, bone, cartilage, heart. We're currently using them in clinical trial for uh, an expanded access for acute respiratory disorder and multiple sclerosis. Uh, uh, you'll see it being used in the orthopedic community for bone and cartilage repair. Uh, so both cells are very important in my opinion and uh, from what I've seen, but you have the option of just doing the cord blood or, do, or doing both the cord blood and the cord tissue. And please remember, these are very, very young cells, which is so important. You will never be able to collect a cell this young because uh, it's it's been protected in the umbilical cord. It has very little exposure to vaccines, to viruses, to env environmental toxins. And also these stem cells have a homing mechanism. And that means that they will migrate to areas of inflammation, very similar to when you cut yourself, your body knows to send clotting factors. The same with stem cells. They are programmed with a homing me uh, mechanism to migrate to areas to reduce inflammation. And they believe that is one of the mechanisms of action for the autism treatments now that they are offering. So as I was saying, the cord blood is a very special cell. It's very young, very unexposed, and it will give rise to all of these cell types. It reboots the immune system. It is used for many of uh, most of the blood disorders, for solid tumor therapy, metabolic disorders, and born areas. You will see 
a list of the AD indications, but it is the master stem cell, as you can see, with the ability to uh, procreate into all of these different cell types. So I want you to be aware that we have been using cord blood stem cells for over 30 years. And uh, primarily it has been used for life-threatening diseases like leukemia, sickle, sickle cell, thalassemia, um, cancer, solid tumors, enzyme diseases. It's uh, when we need to reboot the immune system, these cells are used to reboot an you know, the entire immune system. However, in the last 15 years, they have noticed through transplants that stem cells do have the ability, these stem cells, to regenerate damaged tissue. And we are moving now into utilizing cord blood and cord tissue stem cells to repair uh, damaged or inflamed cells. For example, we are now using cord blood to treat children who have a diagnosis of autism. And the mechanism of action is basically it is transfused through the perif peripheral brain, perif excuse me, the peripheral vein, and then it migrates uh, to the brain uh, because most children with autism do have inflammation in the brain. One of the major benefits also of cord blood stem cells is that it's able to cross the brain barrier. Not many pharmacological agents can, but because of this is cellular therapy, the cord blood stem cell can pass the brain barrier. This whole new field where we're repairing damaged tissue is known as regener regenerative medicine or cellular therapy. And this is going to continue to advance. And that's why it's so important for families to take advantage of the option of preserving these stem cells. These will be the most healthiest cells that you will be able to use for regenerative repair. And also they do um, actually replicate more cells than any other cell that we have available in the United States. And that's because it's so young. Uh, we only have three available cell types here in the United States for therapy, bone marrow, peripheral stem cells, and cord blood. And of the three, cord blood is the only stem cell that is still able to differentiate outside its cell type same with cord tissue. And also it is the cell that is most likely to be used now in regenerative therapy because it is able to differentiate outside its cell type. Uh, people ask me who can use it for cord blood. It's a, a perfect match for the baby, especially in regenerative therapies. They prefer that they use the baby's own stem cells for autism, cerebral palsy, traumatic brain injury. However, because there's been such a demand for cord blood stem cells for families that have not banked, they are now allowing um, matched siblings. And that could even be a partial matched sibling. We match by tissue type, not by blood type. And a full match is six on six tissue markers, which are determined by your ethnicity, and a partial match is under that. And many of the partial matches are very successful because, again, we don't see as much rejection from this type of cell because it's so young and so unexposed to environment. Uh, environmental toxins. Uh, so we're been told by the transplant physicians that it's uh, at least a, a minimum of 75% chance of finding a partial or full match within the immediate family. Uh, with parents, it's a 50% chance of a full match because each parent is donating their genetic tissue to that child. Remember, there is no risk to the mother or baby in collecting cord blood stem cells. It takes place after the cord has been cut. It's completely painless as well. And of course, there's no ethical concerns with the cell type. It has already been identified as a blood master cell and a master structural cell. So there's no ethical issues as, uh, as well. Uh, we have been using cord blood stem cells, as I mentioned, for over uh, 30 years, and these are the type of disorders that we are have been using uh, cord blood stem cells for. So you want to look at this, make sure if you have any family history of any of these disorders, this is a concern to you. You may want to move forward and collect these stem cells. Uh, um, uh, after the birth of your baby. Uh, please note for solid tumors and neuroblastomas, retinoblastomas, um, and uh, bone blastomas, 
you would be using the baby's own stem cells. Uh, if it is a genetically linked disorder, such as sickle cell, they would be using the siblings. And that's why most families today bank each child's cord blood stem cells. It's not only a perfect match for regenerative therapy for that baby, but if there is a genetic disorder or disease that comes about, they have stem cells from a sibling that's free of that disease. This is a list of the FDA approved cord blood treatments. This is standard treatments that you can find at hospitals around the United States. These are uh, in disorders that uh, insurance will cover for stem cell transplant as approved by your transplant physician. And as I mentioned, when I started, there was 20 approved indications. You can see it's more than double. And I'll be happy to send this out to any families that would like to have a copy of this information and actually can follow up with you. So I mentioned that we're moving into this new paradigm of medicine called regenerative medicine. And it's extremely important that you know about this because you are preserving currently now, but what's to come in the future is very, very exciting. And that's the whole benefit of preserving these stem cells. You can take advantage of what's yet to come. And I'm really going to talk personally about this now. Um, I had a family that I worked with many years ago that stored their cord blood. And then the mother contacted me and said her daughter was diagnosed with cerebral palsy at two years old. Well, a clinical trial was just starting at Duke and we were able to send that unit to Duke University where that baby was transfused with her own cord blood stem cells and successfully. And I'll never forget what the mother had said to me. She said, you know, Mary, when I saved my baby's cord blood stem cells, I thought, you know, save this for the cancers, even though it doesn't run in my family. We know, you know, people as they age are more susceptible to cancer. She said, I never in my, you know, realm thought I'd be using these stem cells for cord, uh, cord blood stem cells for cerebral palsy. Well, she did, and the outcome was great. Um, baby has shown improvement. So please note that there are going to be more advances coming about that will not even be on this list. But right now we're looking at heart disease. We're looking at core blood and core tissue stem cells to treat damaged hearts. Alzheimer's has been in clinical trial for the last two years. Uh, what we're doing is looking at the way of using cord blood and core tissue stem cells to cross the brain brain barrier and reduce inflammation. We have been using in clinical trial, both the cord blood and cord dish tissue to repair, repair damaged tissue for stroke. Type 2 diabetes, if that runs in your family, I strongly consider, I would strongly consider preserving both cell types. Uh, we do know that the cord blood stem cell has been used as an uh, immunological support and protection for children that are high risk for uh, for getting type one and for type two diabetes. And I will talk further with anybody who has a family history of that disease. Uh, because cord tissue grows vessels, we are looking at vascular disease. Spinal cord injuries is in clinical trial, uh, both here in Rutgers with a sister transplant facility in China. And then traumatic brain injuries, extremely important that we are looking at cord blood to treat any kind of brain injury because it will migrate to the brain and reduce inflammation. And I'm looking at time. Allison, just cue me. I know, I know, I know. It's going to it's gonna automatically um, end us. And I know it's such great information. Um, we are going to make sure to share your presentation because I know you've got a lot more slides to get through. Someone did have a question though. They were yes, wondering... Please. Yeah, they were wondering if you can get stem cells after a C-section. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's been done for many, many years. Yes, it's, it's the same procedure. Um, and if, for those of you, um, you can delay cord clamp. So I don't need, we want you to stay on your birth plan. Uh, cord tissue is completely unaffected by the uh, delayed cord clamping. You can clamp up to two minutes for cord blood, which is beyond what the ACOG is representing. And I'm just, how much time do I have left, Allison? Just about another minute. I'm so okay. sorry. I know. All right, I'm just going to run through the slides. These are the different cell types for cord tissue. We're just about done. These are some of the clinical trials. And if um, you would like to get a kit, 
please contact me directly. You will get a special pricing for this program. Um, this Texas is one of the states that mandates cord blood education. Thank you, Allison. And I will help you every step of the way. I will be your navigator. We have a lot of financial plans, so there's no burden on the families financially. Um, it's become so much easier than when I started many years ago to do cord blood banking financially. Uh, you'll never regret this. Um, I've never had any of the families say that they've regretted collecting cord blood and I've worked with over 8,000 families, but I have had families that have been heartbroken not to do cord blood. So this is something that you must take seriously, must really look at your family history. And um, I want you to reach out and I'll answer all of your questions. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, Allison, is there any um, anything else that you would like me to address? Um, someone uh, asked about prematurity and if it works the same. Yes, and it's especially important if you are high risk. We can overnight, we can get a kit to you. Uh, we've done a lot of transplants for babies that had hypoxia or had lung problems due to prematurity. Uh, please, yes, reach out to me if you are high risk uh, pregnancy. And we suggest getting your kit 60 days in advance just in case of a premature birth as well. So there's no cost to receive a kit. We only financially process when we receive the kits back to our uh, accredited lab. So don't wait to get a kit. I won't actually make sure that you get a kit as soon as possible if you're high risk, but I do recommend getting a kit 60 days in advance. Anything else, Allison, that we want to collect? No, okay. no we're going to give everyone a potty break. So guys, thank <laughs> you so much. And um, we're just going to take a quick two minute break. Um, I know we had said five, but I want to make sure we stay on track so that we don't, you know, keep you all day. Marion, thank you so much. And uh, this will be recorded for everyone to be able to access. And if you'll, we'll also make sure to uh, send out your presentation as well. So thank you so much, y'all. All, all right. happy. Um, you have a great rest of the day. You too, everyone. Be well. Thank you for everything. Thank you. Bye, Bye now.